What's up, everybody? This is Shannon Clancy, Program Director, Director for the Junior Wizards, and welcome back to the Monumental Coaches Academy. Uh, our coach today is Coach Eric Tebow. He is the as Associate Head Coach for the Washington Mystics. Uh, coach, thanks for her taking some time out and talk to us today. Thanks for having me on. So I, 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 I want to start here. Usually we start with asking, asking coaches about their, their background, but you, you obviously have a slightly different situation that you've been around high level coaching literally every day of your life. So did you always want to follow in, in those footsteps? Was coaching always something you wanted to do or was there like a rebellious, I want to be in an accountant phase and not do this basketball thing? uh what how talk to us about that how did how, when did you know that you wanted to to do this yeah uh as you said I was around it from from a really young age especially growing up in in Omaha uh with my dad Mike Tebow was coaching the Omaha Racers in the old CBA and then he was with Milwaukee Bucks and um, that obviously was a lot of my childhood before he got into the WNBA side in Connecticut um, but no, I, I wouldn't say I knew I wanted to coach, um, probably till I was in college. I thought I was going to be, a in, in sports media, um, a sports writer or something. I went to Missouri university of Missouri for journalism school, but a couple years in, I was working with, uh, the women's team there. And I just kind of, there's like an, an itch that you can only scratch working with the team. It's not the same, just being on the outside looking in. And, um, I knew that was the direction I wanted to take. Cool. And, and so you, so you started, uh, with some coaching in, in college. So you were a grad assistant at St. John's, is that right? And, and then you did some work at VCU. So talk to us about the difference between college and the pros, making that jump, what your responsibilities were in one place versus now you're working with the highest of high levels. Uh, talk to us about that. Yeah, my, I mean, uh, my, my grad assistant experience was hugely helpful, um, even to this day in my career. Um, I did a year as a grad assistant at Missouri and then two at St. John's. Um, and you just learn how like the nuts and bolts of everything works of a college operation, which is, you know, indifference to the pros. You, you're dealing a lot with recruiting. You're worrying about, you know, you're doing class checks, making sure your players are going to class. Um, you know, I, I talked to Ryan Richmond about this a lot, you know, you're getting bagels, you're getting coffee, you're doing all this stuff that you just, you know, um, that you don't have to think about if you just think of coaching. It doesn't really necessarily have that much to do with, with your X's and O's or your uh, game strategy, stuff like that. But, um, and on the pro side of it, I, I would say I get to spend a lot more time just thinking about basketball. Um, not that we don't worry about some of those things, the, the behind the scenes things for players that you got to do to take care of people. Um, and operationally and all that but I get to spend a lot of time thinking about player development game planning style of play um, scouting players you know you're not having to go recruit 17 and 18 year olds and convince them um, we get draft picks we have to convince some free agents but um, yeah it's a lot more basketball centric I would say and talk to us about uh, exactly what your role as associate head coach what that entails with with the mystics yeah, I've got my hand a little bit in everything. Uh, it's one of one of the great things about being on our staff is that Coach T kind of lets everybody on staff um, have a voice in in all aspects of what we do. Uh, primarily, I coach the guards, um, but again, I don't even do that alone. We have other people on staff that that chip into that. Um, I do my share of the college scouting, draft prep, game preparation, scouting reports, um, and then just kind of an overall input to to you know, as we go through the course of the season, our strategy about our defense and our offense, I would say I spend a little bit more time um, kind of doing the daily check-ins on our defense um, and, and the film prep for that. Uh, but it, it's great. I mean, we really get to have a hand in a lot of things. Uh, right now, it's, it's a little bit more about planning for next year and player, you know, how we're going to structure our player development for players um, and how we're going to structure our roster going into, the, going into next season. And, and that must be in this current climate, not being able to have that, that personal touch that you guys would normally have and, and have everybody, uh, whether it's in Mark, I know a lot of the, the players would go overseas normally, um, but even that might change in, in some cases here with, with what's going on. So how is, and going even further, you got, you just got back from the wobble. So how, how has, how has COVID and everything that's gone on, how has that really impacted and changed what your, what your tasks are and, and how you, you operate as a coach. 
I mean, like, like a lot of people right now, I'm working from home primarily. Um, I'm used to being in our, in our facility every day and checking in with, with the staff, having uh, conversations with Wizards and GoGo staff, which uh, was a great way to generate ideas. Um, at some point, we may have a couple players in to, to work out in the offseason like we kind of typically do. But even then, that's been on hold a little bit until um, we kind of need to get to that stage. And then we have, like you said, we have players overseas. And I've actually been surprised about how many players are overseas. It's, it's, uh, it hasn't been that different from the norm. And so we're just trying to stay in contact with them. One, just about their safety, um, about the status of their teams and leagues overseas. But um, also in the back of our mind, in the back of their mind, we're just trying to keep them uh, tuned into the things that we think they can improve on um, and, and to best prepare them for next season, whether it's physically – uh, skill wise, mentally, just getting through a, a tough winter in another country. Um, so that's the kind of the things we're trying to keep tabs on. And what well, obviously, I mean, this year has been, been as crazy as any, any, um, there's been a lot of coaches who, especially now as they're getting closer to high school season and whatnot, that are, are dealing with their, their players and, and the environment that the, the world is in right now. So trying to deal with, in, in some cases, things that they can't possibly understand. They can't understand what their players are going through. Um, and, and you had to deal with that, obviously, in the moment, in the wobble with, with all the, the social changes in our country and unrest and, and how the WNBA has responded to that. So uh, I guess my question would be, what advice would you give to that that high school coach, that AAU coach who is in that similar situation and, and is trying to relate to their players and, and figure out how to help navigate them through this time. Uh, with a lot of uncertainty, I think comes anxiety, right? Um, you know, you, you, it's, it's so easy to worry about a lot of things that are out of your control. Um, as we were getting ready to prepare to go down into the wobble, as you said, uh, we didn't know. We didn't even know what our individual workouts were going to look like. We didn't know when we were going to leave. We didn't know our schedule until we got down there. Um, you know, a lot of our preparation was was in the air. Player, we had players that were dealing with, um, you know, trying to get waivers to play or not play. Uh, so we really tried to put a premium on just what what can we control? What can we, you know, where can we direct our players' attention and focus? The ones especially that we knew wanted to come play. Um, it was, hey, you know, it's not going to be normal. Um, I think that's okay to acknowledge, like, this is not the situation anybody would have chosen. Um, but we're going to go and have a workout tomorrow and we're going to plan it out and we're going to try to get you ready. We're not going to, you know, we're going to understand our players maybe weren't physically where they normally were getting into a season. So we didn't try to like treat it like a normal season. We weren't going to have these long workouts or practices where we just, you know, stressed about our conditioning. We wanted to build it up given the context of the situation we were in. So, um, you know, for, for coaches that are getting ready to prepare that, uh, you know, one, control the things you can control. Two, make sure your players know that it's okay to have some of these concerns and anxiety and that um, you understand it. And you're, you're probably going through the same thing yourself in your own life. Um, and I would say three, and just know that you can be a sounding board. Like, you know, it doesn't, um, it doesn't have to be everything internalized. You can get it out in the open and talk about it. I thought that was something that was really helpful with our team. Cool. So let's pivot to basketball. Uh, what did you want to talk to us about uh, today? What do you what do you have for us? Well, I want to talk a little bit about transition offense, um, specifically in terms of what the idea of, of running in transition looks like. Um, you know, you hear a lot of players, a lot of coaches say we want to be a running team. Uh, we want to play up tempo. We want to get out in transition. We want to push the ball and. A lot of times what players really mean is I want the ball in transition. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's a more like, Hey, actually, I just want the ball or I want to run when I get the ball. Um, so I want to, the first thing I want to talk about is what that looks like. Can I share my screen here? Is that all right? Absolutely. So this is from our playoffs um, back in 2019 our championship run these first few clips and I want to watch uh, you'll see there's a couple people that'll be highlighted on the screen but as the shot goes up and we get our first rule you know kind of with our team is that anybody can get it off the glass and push it if you work on so as, as coaches are doing skill development we really encourage these breakout dribbles from our post players if a wing grabs it point guards can run the floor uh, but I want to watch Tiana Hawkins who you'll see in a second right there 
run in the middle lane. You can see the arrow direct in where she's going to the rim. But both her and our wings are going to run the same every time. So you see Tiana right here. Uh, middle lane gets rewarded. Point guard Christy Tolliver's got her eyes up looking for her running. But that means Tiana's got to run that way every time. So as we see again here, Maisha Hines-Allen, post player, takes it off the glass. She's pushing it. Tiana's running. She's running the same way whether she gets this ball or not. Now you got Shatori Walker, Kimbrough getting to the corner. Tiana draws that defender to the rim. Wings are sprinting wide and deep. Uh, we really encourage those guards to get into the corners if they're not going to get an early kick ahead pass. All right. This uh, time. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Just to go back on, on your point, just getting out and running lanes. Well, do you make it, I, I think you might have said this, but do you have it so that the players, whoever, like the two is always on the right side or the three is always on the left side? Or is it just a matter of, all right, we get the rebound, fill lanes, and you just let, allow the players, they know what lanes they have to fill and they just fill it. So is it more preset or is it something that's just kind of free flowing based on who's out front, who's guarding who and whatnot? Yeah, I would say, I would say we're, we're more on the free flowing side. I mean, when we, when we drill it early in camp, it'll be more um, wings to the corners or two and three uh, to the corners. Now we don't stay, specify two is one side, three is the other. We have some, you know, kind of naturally developed certain ways sometimes. Um, we usually run an early post out to the rim, which is maybe a little bit different than some NBA teams now uh, who you're seeing more five outlooks. We still have a lot of good post players on our team and in our league. Um, we try to get a trailer that's behind the three-point line, but you'll see in these next couple clips, it gets a little interchangeable. If we have a post that can shoot, they might run to the corner. Um, if, a po uh, if we have a wing or a post player that can handle the ball, our point guard might run wide um, or be the trail spot instead of just you know, making sure they're calling for the ball every time. Uh, so, no, I would say we're, we're more free-flowing. Uh, we have more spots on the floor that we want to fill. It's wide trailer, corners deep um, than we do necessarily, like, one, two, three, four, five. You have to be in these spots. Uh, so this next one here, Emma Meesman is running the middle lane. And, and like, we, like I just kind of said a second ago, we still encourage early post-ups from our bigs. Uh, Emma's a great scorer on the block. Elena Deladon, Latoya Sanders, Tiana Hawkins, and Maisha Hines-Allen this year. But you'll see again, Emma comes and seals early. And here's what we're talking about with our lanes. We got two, this is actually a big lineup for us. We got three post players in the game, but we're going to stay spaced wide at the trail spot. Now this is our point guard, Natasha Cloud, sprinting to the opposite corner. We have a chance to post up a mismatch, but because we have great spacing, we can see that weak side. And then one more look, uh, same idea right now. We've run wide, we've run wide. This is Ariel Powers, a wing player who takes it off the glass. We've got a point guard here running wide, wing running wide, bigs to the, the trail spot. And this is now Tiana Hawkins, a big running wide to the corner. Uh, and we get a driving lane because our spacing has been so good. And then last uh, clip I'd like to show from this segment, when we talk about running hard. Now we get a little lucky here. I think Dallas blows this layup. But just watch the first couple steps of these players up here around the foul line, Latoya Sanders and Ariel Atkins. Soon as Elena Deladon's got it off the glass, boom, everybody's out sprinting. Now we get, again, great spacing in transition. People wide, deep to the corner. All of a sudden, it's five on four. And I think we're all in the scoring area right here at 20 on the shot clock. Like we've already got the corners filled, wings wide and everybody's in scoring position at 20 on the shot clock. That's what uh, to us sprinting hard in transition looks like. So obviously you're dealing with professionals the high, at the highest sure. level of their game. When, when, what advice would you give to coaches who, who want to drill this into players who might be just learning or, or a high school team that doesn't quite understand first at, from two points, number one, running the floor that hard and getting out like immediately, we get the ball, we go drilling that every day is that something you do every day in practice is that something that they need to like install into their practice plans and and the second part the spacing aspect and being able to so often you see especially young players they'll just run right down the middle of the floor but being able to understand that no you need to spread out wide and even if you don't get the ball you're gonna make that defense make have to make a decision whether whether they're gonna stick you in the corner or whether they're gonna stay in the middle and that might get someone else a layup. So 
how how do we go about like instilling this into our into our younger players what drills what type of advice would you give our coaches on on allowing them to to really put that in yeah if you want if this is the way you want to play you know everything that you do um, in terms of a practice plan or what you drill probably needs to reflect that uh, we do a lot of early in training camp we do a lot of like quick outlet drills um, where we're working on the bigs taking it out of the net quickly or off a miss quickly and our point guards or our wings are getting up the floor early you know if you can train those first couple steps um it really sets everything up for your break you know we'll do like a lot of teams have done we'll put uh markers on the floor in the corners and wide on the wings you know a lot of times a, a simple visual cue um helps train that early on and players start getting to those spots naturally on their own um like you said, even if you, you know, maybe even if you're not a great three point shooter, but if you can space wide, you can now get to play against closeouts. So we'll do maybe two on two, three on three, small sided games uh, where catches have to be behind the three point line. Uh, they don't, you know, you don't even, you don't have to shoot the ball, but now you can catch, you can attack a closeout. If somebody wants to sag back and you want to dribble into a pull up jumper because that's more comfortable, you can still do that catching it behind the three point line. Um, so yeah, outlet drills, small sided games where you encourage these things. And then I think you, you, you tend to turn a corner, right, where it becomes easier to run it back at somebody uh, than it is to have to walk it up the floor and play against a, a set defense. I think players generally buy into it once they start to get that feeling for, um, you know, it's, it's, it's easier to make a team keep having to run back on defense than having it come at you every time. Yeah. I, anything, anything else, like playing fast and getting out and running is fun. It, yeah. I, I don't whenever I see teams that are slow, like I get it works, but I just for me, it's always I don't want to play that way. I want to get up and down. I want to run. I want to I want to have fun like that's get some extra baskets, steal some from from the other team like that. That to me is fun. I'm not disrespecting anybody who wants to play slow or anything. But um, yeah, I, I, that's I agree with that completely. Where just just the second you get them to see that and get up and down the floor, they start to buy in because it's it's fun. It's fun to get up and down the floor. It's fun to score baskets. Like that's, we're not having fun. Why are we doing this? But anyway, I'm not about a bit. It. And, and one other note I'd say, and if I, if you don't mind me showing a couple more clips here, absolutely. Some of it, when it comes down to person, I know, I know coaches at, at the high school level don't necessarily have um, the choice of what players are getting, right. It's who's in their school or who's in their, their district. Um, but that doesn't mean you can't reward the players that try to do the things you want to do. Uh, we have a player, Natasha Cloud, who's been our point guard for the last several years. And one of her best skills is that she pushes it up the floor every time. We don't actually lead the league in pace. We don't have crazy possessions. But if you'll watch on a couple of these clips right here from her, um, she's going to get that outlet and just one or two dribbles, she's across half court. Now, these are drag screens here. We're just planning to, trying to play with tempo. But you saw in some of those clips, her outlets are up the floor with tempo attacking uh and so if you have a play you know it's 50 50 you got a couple talented players that are uh in the same boat or AU team and you're going out and trying to pick players for your team and you want to play fast you know this is what what somebody can do simple drag screen she's staring down the roll we get up behind it on the weak side uh so it's simply you know N Natasha wasn't super highly regarded coming out of college she was on people's radar but we just liked her tempo that she knew how to use these screens in transition and she makes other people better uh nothing better than a selfless selfless point guard and all of a sudden the floor opens up for her because she's pushed it pushed it pushed it shared the ball with everybody else and now she gets a chance uh, to attack the rim yeah i mean you can really see even just in this these transition clips just the spacing on the floor just opens so much for, for everybody and, and how everyone just buys in that we need to get to our spots. We need to spread the floor and it's not necessarily going to be our shot, my shot, rather it's going to be our shot. Like we, me going to the corner is going to drag that defense over and that might get Natasha a, a better driving lane to get to the basket. Um, yeah. Let's say in every one of our film sessions, there's probably a clip where we try to highlight a teammate, running hard and having great spacing to get another teammate a shot um, because that's something that doesn't show up in the box score. It's not going to make a highlight reel, but if you have a wing that sprints hard to the corner so that her teammate can get a drive to the rim or a post player can get a touch with great spacing uh, very rarely do those clips not make our next day edit uh, to try to encourage that behavior as much as we can. 
Cool. So what's, what is one of the, for our coaches out there, what's the most overlooked skill for a basketball player that, that coaches aren't necessarily putting them either putting enough time in developing or, or not, not identifying enough with younger players? What, what is it that you look for those intangibles or maybe not even an intangible, just something that's kind of overlooked? Well, I would say just like a high, uh, a high care factor, if you will. Um, people that just are about winning, that want to play the right way. Um, there are skills that can be developed, but it's really hard to develop that, that inner drive and desire, um, especially if it's directed into the team. Uh, if it's not, you know, it, it's great to have a player that wants to, to be individually great. They want to get better and better and better. But, you know, one thing we've really tried to do here is identify players who we thought were about winning, about team. Uh, I, and I think that goes as, you know, as young as, as you can find players. I, I think that changes the entire dynamic of a team um, if you have a couple of those players. Now, you, can, you can't have 15 of those players who can't play. Um, you're not going to win a ton of games, but you've got to have some people that are just all about, all about the team. Uh, even for us, we've got players who, you know, Elena Deladon is the MVP of the league. She's one of the greatest scorers of all time, but she's all about the team and it set, and it sets the tone for everything we do. And, and how, how Elena being an MVP coming in a couple of years ago, there were already some players in place who were, who are getting, you know, might have their touches taken away or something like that. Um, and in Kyle in the pros, everybody was at one point, you know, the best player on their team uh, or one of the best players on the team. So, so what advice would you give to coaches to just al- talk about team, just allowing everyone to kind of understand their role and understand that for us to win and for us to get better, you might not get the ball as much as you want or are used to doing, but we're going to be better because it, because you're going to go set it, go set it, this screen that you might not have thought of doing before. Or you're going to make sure that you are wide and in the corner where you're supposed to be weak side, not on the ball, but that's going to free something else up for someone else. So how do we get our younger players, especially maybe in the AAU world where you kind of bring them all together and to drop that ego and understand that there's a bigger picture that we're, we're looking at here. So you said younger players or parents? <laughs> well, that's, yeah, I know. Yeah. I know. It's, um, you know, I think, I think players, you know, I think are fairly realistic um, for the most part, not, not everybody about what their skills are. They can look at a teammate and say, Hey, she, you know, he or she is really good. Um, what I said before about really highlighting the things that you value um, as a coach, you know, if they're get, if all the attention from the outside is always going to be scoring highlights, re, you know, stats, whatever uh, awards, you've got to make sure that you internally are highlighting the things that you think are important. And I think that maybe sometimes we think we are, um, we think they know that we value it, but you got to almost exaggerate it a little bit. Like if somebody's a great screener, you can't just take it for granted. Um, you've got to really highlight those things that that you value that that person does well, um, and that becomes their role. You know, somebody always players always want to know, hey, I don't know what my role is. Um, well, your role is one, what we need you to do to win. But here's all these things you do well. Um, you want to shoot more. Well, one, can you make those shots? Uh, and, and two, that's great, but you're already providing value in a lot of these other areas that we're constantly reinforcing the, the, the positive nature of it. Um, it's tricky. You know, when we had uh, Elena come here, we had a lot of players that understood right away that she was our best player, um, that, that their lives probably just got easier by having her on the team. We, from a, a coaching front office position, had to look at how do players fit with Elena um, from a roster standpoint, but we, you know, there's some players that, that had a little bit of a tough time when we said, Hey, Elena's got to make sure we got to make sure she touches it constantly to set up everybody else. Um, and it's tough. I, I, there's not an easy answer to that situation. Um, and that, you know, it kind of goes back to the quality of people you have. Yeah. And I think going, going back to your, your comment on, on the parents, I, I do think that the stronger your culture is on your team, and like you said, rewarding that player who's setting that great screen, uh, screen uh, really not just only cheering for the person when they're, when they're scoring all the time, like 
if someone on the floor is diving for the ball, like you as a coach need to be like really hyping that up. Or if they're really hustling, they're getting a lot of rebounds. They're doing, they're making the pass that leads to the assist, all of, like highlighting those things, the players start to buy into it. And the more the players buy into it, you, you're always going to get your, your crazy parents who might not get it, but they love their kids. So they are blinded sometimes. But if the players really buy into it, the parents most of the times fall into line and start to buy into that culture also. So I, I think it's all interconnected there. Scotty Brooks said it great um, to me a few years back. He, he said, we're trying to, you know, make sure that above all else, we're celebrating each other's success um, from a teammate. You know, even on the NBA side, they have to deal more with media and uh, outside pressure and fans. He's like, internally, we have to celebrate each other's success uh, because that that's so powerful. If you can get players to, to really root for each other, um, it, it kind of counterweights a lot of the other stuff. Cool. Exactly. So coach, that was great. Uh, really appreciate the, uh, the stuff you put together for us. Uh, appreciate the time and uh, hope to talk to you again. Take care. Stay, stay right. safe out there, everybody.